Good morning and happy Mother's Day again to all you mamas out there. Uh, I pray that God continues to give you wisdom and grace as you continue to walk with your children. The job of a mother never stops. Again, whether you still have children in the home or they're grown and gone with children of their own, it is a unique calling and a beautiful calling God's given you. So it's a joy to honor you today. I also just wanna say, perhaps for some of you, this is your first Mother's Day without mom here anymore. And I pray that in the midst of that prolonged period of grief that God fills your mind today with beautiful memories of the way your mom did love and care and guide you. Again, it's just a joy to get to honor you moms this morning. But what we're gonna do today is we're gonna continue the book we started last week. We began a new series in the book of 2 Thessalonians. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open up to 2 Thessalonians chapter one. If you don't have a Bible, the ushers would love to put one in your hands. You can also just look it up on your phone and a lot of the passages I'll put up on the screen as well. But last Sunday, as we started this series, we saw how this second letter to the, the believers in Thessalonica, the city in, in, in um, uh, Macedonia, it was probably written within about a year of the first letter that we just finished studying. And it was written to address the, uh, the church's concern and confusion and even just their distress over a false prophetic message that had come to them, basically contradicting what Paul said in the first letter, saying, you missed the day of the Lord. And the, the persecution, the suffering that's ramped up, that's actually God's judgment on you because you weren't truly followers of Jesus. And so again, very critical moment for Paul as the pastor to write them and say, no, don't worry. You're on the right track. You haven't missed it. We saw last week in this really interesting way that, that Paul says to them, yes, in one sense, they're suffering is evidence of God's righteous judgment on them. But not in a negative sense, but in a very positive sense. He says, it's the evidence of God's righteous judgment so that you may be considered worthy of God's kingdom because that's what you're suffering for. You're suffering for your belief that Jesus is king, that he is bringing the good life-giving rule of God to defeat his enemies and restore all creation. That's the gospel you believed and that's what you're suffering for. And in the midst of the persecution that was coming to them because of their faith, he said in the verses right before, he says, here's what's happening. As persecution is pressing down upon you, what's coming out of your life? Your faith is growing abundantly. Your love for one another is growing. You're being steadfast. You're remaining under those trials that God's put in your path. That's the evidence that you will be on the right side of God's judgment when it comes because your life has already been being shaped by Jesus as king. Well, what we're gonna see this morning is that this theme of God's judgment continues to run throughout the rest of the book of 2 Thessalonians, and especially we'll see in the rest of chapter one. And maybe as you hear me say that, that today we're gonna to be talking about God's judgment, it makes you a little bit nervous. Maybe today you're, you're visiting with us, you don't normally come with us, you came with mom for Mother's Day and you've already shot her a look like going seriously. The one Sunday I come with you and the guy up there, he's gonna talk about the judgment of God on Mother's Day. Yeah, I, I am. But, but please don't tune me out. We didn't purposefully plan to teach on God's judgment on Mother's Day. It's just the next passage in this book that we're going through. But also, I don't think that we should avoid as an important a topic as the judgment of God just because it's Mother's Day, right? So let's see this together. I don't want to avoid this. The judgment of God is a heavy ta topic. And it's one that I think we, we tend to avoid thinking about. But it's important. I would say this to you, our, our greatest hopes and our greatest fears are all wrapped up around this idea of the judgment, the righteous judgment of God. All of our longing for how we want the world to be, all of our anger when we see evil and injustice in the world, all of that almost ultimately points us to the great day that we'll see this morning when Jesus is revealed from heaven and renders perfect justice with impartiality and with precision. So I would say this, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, I think there's two things that we can all agree on. First is this, we want to see justice done in the world. 
And yet the second one, if we're honest with ourselves, we recognize that perfect justice poses a problem for us. Because for God to bring perfect justice means that we will have to face up to the ways that we've done wrong. The ways that we've overlooked others or belittled others or just simply not cared about them in our own self-interest. So I think when a topic like God's judgment, it produces two thoughts in our heads. On the one hand, we want to see justice and we fear justice at the same time. And that's what the good news of Jesus Christ is all about. That's why it's such good news. The Bible presents Jesus as God who became man, both to bring that perfect judgment against evil and corruption and that people have brought on his world. Not only to bring judgment, but also then to provide in himself the way for sinful, unjust people like you and I to be forgiven and rescued and restored because Jesus came to satisfy his own justice on our behalf. So yes, even on Mother's Day, it's worth our while to consider carefully both the promise and the warning that this chapter has for us. Last week, I talked about how we need to understand that there are, there are two sides to God's judgment. It's like two sides of one coin. There's a positive aspect for those who have turned and trusted in Jesus as king. And there is a negative aspect for those who do not turn and trust Jesus. I think part of the reason why we can tend to avoid thinking about God's judgment is we just think about that second half. We just think about the negative half. But it's really important that we keep both sides of the coin in mind. And what we're gonna see in our passage this morning is that it's basically like Paul just keeps turning that coin back and forth, showing us both sides of it. We've already seen how he starts with the positive here. That because of their faith in Jesus, these believers in Thessalonica, what's coming out of their life shows that they will be considered worthy of God's kingdom when it comes. But what about those who are causing their suffering? What about those who are persecuting them? Look at verse six with me. Since indeed God considers it just to repay affliction to those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us, speaking of Paul and his companions who likewise were suffering for their faith. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. This is heavy. But look at that part that I highlighted up there. God considers it just. What he describes here is just according to God's sight, his estimation of things. And that's a really important point to make clear from the outset. The justice that the Bible speaks about is the justice that you and I don't get to determine. We don't get to determine, what, define what justice is. God does not answer to us He does not have to run his plans by us for our approval before he implements them. And I would say this, if you have eyes to see it, that truth that God defines justice is a very good thing. You see, regardless of how smart you may be, how powerful you may be, how seriously other people take your words, Whoever you are, our perception as humans is so small, so limited, so based upon, so lim- dependent upon the limited experiences that we've had, and so prone to misunderstand, misinterpret those experiences, that the reality is we cannot wrap our minds around what justice for all would actually look like, let alone bring it about. We're just too small for that. It's beyond our capabilities. And I would say to you that anyone who would say otherwise is either just looking to argue or they have a massive, massive Messiah complex. They have far too big of an estimation of their own capabilities. But what is far beyond our capabilities is not beyond God's capabilities. He alone sees and knows all. Nothing skips his sight. He alone has a perfect memory. He alone is perfectly good and perfectly powerful, and he will hold all people to account. 
This is justice in God's sight. Look again. Since God indeed considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us, based upon, upon God's perfect understanding of justice, he considers it just to repay with affliction those who are afflicting the Thessalonians, to repay them in kind. This is just in God's sight. And yet at the same time, he says, it is also just for him, in verse seven, to grant relief to the Thessalonian believers as well as to Paul and his companions who were being persecuted for their faith. Like you see both sides of the coin. There's affliction and there's relief all tied into this idea of the judgment of God. But when will this happen? Well, that's what verse seven, the rest of verse seven explains. When is this going to happen? When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. This is another way for Paul to speak about the same event that in the first letter we saw he called the parousia of Jesus, the royal coming, his royal arrival as king and us as his people meeting him and ushering him into his kingdom. Same idea, but just same event, but just looked at from a different perspective. The point that Paul's emphasizing here is this idea that it is Jesus' revealing that he will be revealed in his second coming in a way that was very different than how he was revealed in his first coming as the baby in the manger, right? That word reveal there, it's the Greek word apocalypsis, which we basically have just brought straight over into English with our word apocalypse. Now again, you hear that word and the first thing you might think of is probably either the end of the world or like a certain villain from the X-Men comics. But the word apocalypse simply means to reveal. It's to pull the curtain back on something and show it for it what it really is. It's like in The Wizard of Oz. Remember that when the Dorothy and the other people, I forget who they all are, they go, they go into the Emerald City and they appear before the great and powerful Oz and there's that giant floating head and the fireballs and all that kind of stuff. And then what does Toto sneak off and do? He pulls back the curtain, right? And you see that the great and powerful Oz is an old man pushing buttons. That was his apocalypse, his revealing for what he truly was. The apocalypse, the revealing of Jesus though, is the exact opposite. Not some great terrifying thing that just turns out to be some dude pushing buttons, but a humble carpenter who is revealed to be king of kings and lord of lords. That's what will be revealed. The revelation of Jesus will be the opposite. Paul knows that he and his followers are being persecuted because the people around them think that it's ridiculous to believe that Jesus truly is God's forever king. Like seriously, a poor, homeless Jewish rabbi who was rejected by his own people and executed by the Romans, that's who you're gonna build your life on? And be, all because his followers say that he rose from the dead, that he ascended to heaven, that he's at the right hand of God right now and he'll come back one day. Seriously, you believe that? Paul himself wrote in, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter one, he goes, I get it. The message that we preach, it's foolishness to those who don't believe. But he says to those who are called, who hear the message of Jesus and recognize the truth and life that it contains, though none of us would have written the story this way if it were up to us, we see that Jesus as Paul says it, is the power and wisdom of God. And what we believe to be true about Jesus now, even though we haven't seen it yet, will one day be clear for all to see when Jesus is revealed from heaven as the power and wisdom of God, as the forever king of God's kingdom, as the judge of the living and the dead. It will be clear one day. You will not be Revealed as a fool when Jesus is revealed. Quite the opposite. But, verse eight, for those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, there will be vengeance. Not out of control rage, 
but measured righteous retribution for those who persist in their rebellion against God. You see, those two phrases there, those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel, I think it's not describing two different groups of people. Paul's using two different phrases to refer to the same group of people. He's using a very common Hebrew technique called parallelism. We see it all over the place in the Psalms where there's two statements repeated in close succession that inform each other. And oftentimes the second one explains more about the first one. That those who do not know God, they're not just those ignorant of the truth. There are those, they are those who did not obey this message of salvation through Jesus. Later on in this book, in chapter 2, verse 10, he refers to the same group of people as those who refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Refuse to love the truth that would save them. What Paul is talking about here is not just people ignorant of the gospel, but those who obstinately refuse to turn and trust in Jesus. And the consequences for them will be severe. Look at verse nine. They, those who do not obey the gospel, will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Guys, this is heavy. This is not something we should never deal with flippantly, casually. We take no sick, twisted pleasure in the idea of the destruction of those who don't believe. But we do acknowledge God's right to judge as he sees fit and his righteousness in doing so. Again, you and I do not define God's justice. And we acknowledge that God is the one who has authority to do that. Now, again, this phrase here, eternal destruction. Let me just pause and explain this for just a second. Because this phrase is often understood differently by Christians. Some take this idea of eternal destruction to refer to destruction that lasts for an eternity, for an unending span of time those apart from Jesus will experience that destruction ongoingly forever. Other people though, they look at this and they say that this eternal destruction idea isn't, even, isn't, isn't first primarily talking about an unending span of time as it is about the finality of the destruction. It's permanent. There's no way going back. They will be destroyed never to be undestroyed. And again, we don't have time to get into the whole debate. There's good biblical reasons for both opinions, but the place where most Christians, Orthodox Christians throughout the history of the church, where we all agree is this. God's judgment, when it comes, will be final. There will be no second chance. God's judgment will be irreversible. There's another point in here that's worth considering. Look again at verse nine. See this part where it says that they will suffer this punishment or this destruction away from the presence of the Lord? In in Greek, that word away isn't there. It's just the, the preposition from, which means that there's two ways that we could interpret what Paul is saying here. One is, again, what we see here in the ESV, this idea that people are sent away from God's presence and that's what destroys them. Their separation from God is what brings the destruction. Or you can also translate it this way. The destruction comes from God's presence. When he is revealed in glory and power, it is his presence that brings destruction and doom upon them. Do you see the difference there? One is separation that brings destruction. The other is the very presence of God that brings destruction. Now, in many ways, I I think uh, you see, especially in the teachings of Jesus, there's oftentimes when he's talking about judgment where he talks about people being cast out, away from me, depart from me. So there is truly a separation from God. But I actually think in this passage, the best way to understand it, both in this passage and in light of the the whole biblical story, is that Paul's talking about a destruction that actually comes from God's glory. There's a number of reasons for that. Number one, most commentators believe that what Paul's doing here is these aren't just his words. He's, He's quoting from Isaiah chapter two. 
Now, you don't have to turn there with me, but, but if you want to check it out later. In Isaiah chapter 2, there's this long expo- uh, uh, prophecy about the day of the Lord, about this day of judgment, where it says that all the pride and loftiness of men and of even evil spirits that stand against God will be brought low, and God alone will be exalted on that day. And three different times in Isaiah chapter 2, there's, there's wording that's very similar to the, what Paul uses here. And it doesn't talk about people being sent away from God's presence. It talks about people trying to get away from God's presence. It says that they will try to go into caves and into into holes in the ground to get away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. You see that? They're not sent away. They're trying to get away. And their point is there is no escape for them. Not only that, we see throughout the biblical story that for sinful humans like you and I, on our own, the glorious, powerful, perfect presence of God is dangerous for us. It is not a safe place for us to be. Like you see this in Exodus chapter 19, in, in that story of when, when God descends on Mount Sinai after leading the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, and he's there on Mount Sinai to form this covenant, to join them to him as his people. And yet in Exodus 19, he speaks very clearly to Moses. He says, don't let the people come up to the mountain." Not even the priests. Don't even put the, let the animals touch the mountain or I will break out against them. This is not God, the hypochondriac who doesn't want to be around the icky, gross people. This is God out of his heart of compassion and protection for his people saying, right now, it's not safe for you to be close to me, so don't try it. For your own protection, I am, I'm keeping a distance between you and I. And yet he calls Moses up onto that mountain with him. And he's there and he, he receives the, the Ten Commandments and the law. He comes down, finds out the people are worshiping the golden calf. They broke the covenant. As soon as it was made, he goes back up on Mount Sinai for that covenant to be reestablished. And then in Exodus 33, after this long process of Moses being there in God's presence in a sense, even Moses has this sense of, I know there's more. And in Exodus 33, he says to God, show me your glory. Can you show me all of it? Can you show me just how great and wonderful you are? You remember what God says to Moses? In your best Jack Nicholson voice, you can't handle it. You can't, right? He says, I will cause all my goodness to pass before you. But before I do that, there's this crack in the mountain. I'm gonna stuff you in there. I'm gonna put my hand over you And then I will cause all my goodness to pass before you. And once I pass by, I'll remove my hand and you can see my back, he says. You can see like the sunset of my glory after it already goes by. He says, but you shall not see my face because no one can see my face and live. The glory of God's presence is destructive to sinful people. There's this really remarkable story in Isaiah chapter six, at the start of Isaiah's ministry, when before he's called to be a prophet of God, all of a sudden he finds himself in the temple standing before God. I saw the Lord high and exalted and the train of his robe filled the temple with glory and these seraphim, these beings that just exist to be in God's presence, like his throne room guardians, they just keep calling out to each other saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And in in this impressive scene, how does Isaiah respond? Oh, shoot, we should sell tickets. This is awesome. No, what does he say? Woe is me. Woe. It's It's a word that basically means it's a proclamation of doom. If I'm here in God's presence, that can, from my thinking, that can only mean one thing. This is it for me. I'm undone. He says, woe me, I'm finished, I'm done for. Because I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm a sinful person. I live amongst the people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. This cannot be good for me. And then this really incredible thing happens. One of those seraphs, the seraphim that are before God's throne, grabs tongs and takes a glowing hot coal from the altar of incense before God's presence. And he comes to Isaiah and he touches his lips with that coal. And he says to him, behold, this has touched your lips. 
your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. That very place that you identified as where this uncleanness came from, I've cleansed that. The point is, because you have now been cleansed, it's okay for you to be here. It's safe for you to be in God's presence. Now, there is so much symbolism in that passage, but the main point is clear. Because we are broken, sinful people, the presence of God, the glory of God is dangerous and destructive to us unless God himself does something to change us, to cleanse us from our guilt and our sin to make it safe for us to be with him again. Because that's the other thing we see throughout God's story. As dangerous as it is for us to be in God's presence, he wants us there. He created us for a relationship with him. He created us to share in his presence. Sin and death and Satan pose obstacles to that. But the story of God is how God defeats those enemies to bring us back to him. That's what the gospel is all about. In Jesus Christ, God himself has come to us to carry our sin and shame, to satisfy his own justice by defeating our sin through his death and resurrection so that now by faith, by trusting in both who Jesus is and what he's done for us, we can be cleansed and forgiven and made new so that we can be with God without being destroyed. That is good news. Look at verses nine and 10 again here. Look what happens on this same day. They, there's one group that suffers the punishment of eternal destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his might. And then there's another group who on that same day, Jesus comes to be glorified in them. His saints, his holy ones, these ones that he's made holy and to be marveled at among all who have believed. Do you, again, do you see the two sides of God's judgment here? The same day, the same event of the revealing of Jesus, his glory has two starkly different outcomes. For one group, the glory of the Lord destroys them. For the other group, the glory of the Lord does not destroy them. Instead, Jesus comes to be glorified in them. That, that, that they will see his glory. They will marvel at his glory, see him as even greater and more wonderful than they could possibly have imagined. And in a miraculous way, not only do they see and marvel at God's glory, they find that they reflect it in some way. They are changed by God's glory. They are transformed. They share in his glory. His glory is, I guess you could say, put on greater display through them. And what is it that makes the difference between these two starkly different outcomes. Look again what he says in verse 10. It's all those who have believed. Those who heard this foolish sounding but life-giving message of Jesus as God's king. And rather than not obeying the gospel, they believed. They trusted. They turned. They believed the gospel that Jesus is God's king. And it's at this point that Paul the pastor wants to remind the Thessalonians where they fall in this whole thing. This other prophecy came in saying, you missed the day of the Lord. He says, no, you didn't. You know why? Because when we came to you with this message about Jesus, our testimony to you was believed. You will be on the right side of God's judgment when he comes because not through anything that you've done, you believed. Even though you're suffering for that belief Right now, it will be worth it in the end. You haven't missed the day of the Lord. You won't be destroyed by Jesus' glory because when he comes, he comes to be glorified in you. You're not foolish to build your life on Jesus. One day you'll see his glory and you'll know that it was all worth it. Let's pause for a second, catch our breath. This same event the day of the Lord, the, the royal arrival of Jesus, his revealing from heaven will result in these two starkly different outcomes. And as this passage makes clear, the dividing line, the thing that makes the difference is what you do with this message about Jesus as king. Do you turn and trust in Jesus? Or do you, as he says in chapter two, refuse to love this truth that can save you? 
for those of us who have trusted in Jesus, the reality of God's coming judgment, and especially looking at both sides of it, it is meant to give us hope. It is meant to give us hope in the midst of suffering and struggle. Whatever you may be going through, it won't be forever. God considers it just to bring you relief one day, and not only relief, but glory and wonder. And yet on the other side, as we think about those that we love, those that we know, who at least to this point have not turned and trusted, they have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus. The heavy reality of God's righteous judgment should break our hearts. It should motivate us to compassion, to concern, to a humble boldness, to even in the midst of opposition, to say, you've got to know this life-giving message, this life-saving message of what Jesus has done. The response that we should have to this, I think Paul illustrates really beautifully in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter five, when he says it like this. He says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There is a sense in which all of us will stand before God as judge. And at that point, what is that body of evidence that will be presented? Is a body of evidence of a life of faith and trust and growing obedience to Jesus that shows you are worthy of God's kingdom? Or is a body of evidence of refusal and rebellion and even putting down those who believed this message because you thought they were fools? We will all stand before this judgment seat of Christ. And so what's the response, verse 11? Knowing the fear of the Lord. He's talking to believers here. Because we know how fearsome, even just the glimpse that we have of how fearsome and awesome this God is, we persuade others. We just seek to persuade, not cajole, not manipulate, bully, or scare. We don't have to try to win debates. We don't have to try to be the smartest person in the world. We just... We just humbly, unashamedly say, this is the truth that I believe about Jesus and this is how it's changing me. A little bit later in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says it again like this. He says, we are ambassadors for Christ. We're his representatives of him as king. We're these ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. So we implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Because for our sake, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we, through him, might become the righteousness of God. That's good news, isn't it? Next Sunday night is our last core four intro class that we'll be doing on this idea of mission and evangelism. We're gonna dive a lot more into especially just what is that heart and mindset that should drive us in the way that we carry this message. I would encourage you to come to that. It'll be from 6.30 to 8.30 on Sunday night. But let me just say this to you right now. If you're, if you're here with this, us this morning and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, this is what I want you to hear. Be reconciled to God by faith in Jesus Christ. Trust in him today. If not, you will still face him as king and judge one day and there will be no escape from the glory of his presence on that day. And what you see here, especially there in verse 21, these are King Jesus's terms of peace. He's coming. He will bring justice. He will right all wrongs. Jesus himself in his ministry talked about the importance of counting the cost to follow him. Even at one point he said, which of you, if you're a king with an army, doesn't first see, okay, wait, there's a king with an army that's twice as big as ours coming. Do we think we can take him? If not, let's send for terms of peace. Let's find out how can we make peace between us. These are Jesus's terms of peace. His life for yours. His righteousness for your sinfulness. You don't need to earn his forgiveness. You couldn't anyway. He offers it as a gift to all who come to him as king and not just the hope of eternal life forever with him, but the hope of new life right now under his good rule. But to receive that amazing gift, you must turn. You must renounce other allegiances and being the captain of your own ship and come to him as king because he is. He's good. He can be trusted. 
Don't refuse him. For those of us who have turned and trusted in Jesus as king, the way I wanna finish, take a couple minutes here to look at how Paul finishes. After laying out all of this really heavy but important truth about the two sides of God's judgments that will be revealed when Jesus comes, how does Paul respond in verse 11? He prays. He prays for the Thessalonians. In this prayer, we see in this short prayer, there's kind of two requests he makes to God and then a purpose, why he's asking for these things. Look at this really quickly. To this end, with this in mind, uh, Eugene Peterson in the message, he said, because we, th- we know that this amazing day is coming, it's close at hand, this is what drives us to pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling that God would make you worthy of his calling. We saw the same word worthy back in verse five of this passage where Paul talks about, hey, the judgment of God is that you will be considered worthy. This this word worthy again came up in the first letter in a way that's I think really, uh, really cool. Check this out. In in the first letter, 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 12, it says this, he, he says, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. You see the same idea of being worthy of God's calling here. But here in 1 Thessalonians, it's you need to walk worthy of God. And then in the prayer here in 2 Thessalonians, it's I'm praying that God would make you worthy. So there's two important questions that we need to ask from that. Number one, this, whose responsibility is it to walk in a manner worthy of God? Ours. And yet, who is the one who makes us worthy? God. How good is that? God, as our good king, he calls us into a partnership with him. He says, you are my ambassadors. You represent me now with your lives. He will hold us responsible for how we represent him. But as a good king, He doesn't only tell us what to do, he supplies us with what we need to do it. The power of God to make us worthy does not take away our responsibility. It enables us to fulfill our responsibility. We have the ability to learn to walk in a manner worthy of God, not through our own ability, but because God himself can do it. That is such good news. It fits in with the second request that Paul makes in this prayer. Not only that we would be worthy of his calling, God would make us worthy of his calling, but he says, may God fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. There's so much hope in this word too. That word resolve, it actually just means desire. Paul prays not only that we as God's people would desire what is good, but that God would fulfill those desires by helping us to put those desires into actual practice, actual good done through our lives for the blessing of others, actual work motivated by our faith. Do you ever struggle right there at that point of connection? I see the good thing. I even wanna do the good thing. But gosh, bringing that to fulfillment, you ever get stuck right there? Sometimes it's hard enough just to even desire what's good. Like we understand as sinful humans being made new by the spirit of God, we still battle against sinful desires. Galatians 5 makes that totally clear. So again, recognize the desire for what is good itself is a gracious gift of God. But God doesn't just want us to desire to do good. Paul's prayer is that God would bring it to fulfillment, to completion, that we would put it into practice. So let me ask you this. Is there something in your life right now that you even have in mind as I've been talking about this? Something that you know you should do. Something that you could even say, yeah, I actually want to. I want to do this. But you haven't acted on that desire. Or perhaps you've struggled to sustain that action, to, 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 to keep it going to follow through with it. Again, it could be something big or small. Gosh, I wanna control my temper. God, would you teach me to control my temper? To break an addiction, to talk to a friend about Jesus. One thing on my mind was, how often throughout the day does someone come to mind and I go, oh, it'd be good to reach out to them? 
and then I just move on to the next thing. Is it good to demonstrate care for one another? Words of encouragement, just checking in? Absolutely it is. I recognize that's a place I get stuck there. Oh, there's a bunch of other stuff I gotta do. I'll do it later and then I don't think about it. Even just something simple for me is going, Lord, when, I, when you bring someone to mind that I can pray for or reach out to or just let them know I love them, help me to follow through on it. Rather than going, oh yeah, that would be a good thing to do and then back on, right? Have you taken on something in this season of life Maybe a bigger task, a project that you know was a good and right thing to do, but as you've gotten into it, you, you realize it's proven to be much more difficult or it's gonna last a lot longer than you thought. Maybe it's taking care of aging parents. You believe what Paul says like in, in 1 Timothy, that, that it is good and right for us as believers to make a return to our parents and care for them in their old age. But you're going, this is tough. How long? How do I figure out how advanced health directives and all that kind of stuff? I pray for you that God would fulfill your desire to do good, help you to follow through, give you the wisdom that you need. Mamas, if you got kids in the home and you're realizing this is tough, that little baby moves around on his or her own now. Oh God, help me, give me patience, right? <laughs> they don't stay where I put them anymore. May God give you that sustained, long-suffering ability to do good in your children's, of life, children's lives by his power. That's the kind of stuff Paul's talking about here. And this is what we get to pray for each other, that God would fulfill our desire for good, our work of faith by his power. Think about that for a second. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave, that power, we can pray that for one another. The same power that will right all wrongs one day, that will abolish sin and death and evil forever. That power, we can say, Father, would you empower us to not just desire what's good, but would you fulfill that desire by putting into real life actions that put your power on display so that people might know and see who you are. I think in each of our lives, there are individual desires for good that we can pray for. But I would also say this, if you've been around Cornerstone over the last year, you know that we've placed a ton of emphasis on this idea of discipleship, of what it means to not only be disciples, but recognizing that the command to be a disciple includes with it the, the command to make disciples, that the two go hand in hand. In the fall, we reintroduced membership here at Cornerstone as a way, really, our heart was just to bring clarity to what that commitment to be and make disciples looks like for us as a local church family. And I would say this, I believe that our desire to be disciples who make disciples is a good thing, amen? It is a work that we have to undertake by faith in God's power. And I pray that God would fulfill that desire by his power. Next week, we're gonna have another one of those membership ceremonies where we're gonna have a group of people who are gonna come up and just say, yeah, we, we want to be a part of that same commitment to be and make disciples. That's gonna be awesome. Some of you guys are gonna be up here with us and we're looking forward to that. I would just say, if you have questions about membership, which again, our, part is, our, our heart is not to make exclusive clubs, but just to say, this is what we think it means to be equipped as disciples who make disciples. You wanna come join us in that. If you have questions or you wanna know more, you can find out a lot more about membership on the website. You can go talk to Kim and Val at the, the info table in the lobby. But look with me real quick as we finish in verse 12. Here's Paul's purpose. Why does he pray these things for us? So that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you want that? Do you want to see Jesus glorified in us and to see us glorified in him? Yes, ultimately on the day of the Lord when Jesus comes to be glorified in his saints. But even now as we seek to live lives that put Jesus on display, do you want that for yourself, for your family, for us as a church family? Then here's what I would encourage you to do. Would you consider taking time this week to regularly read and even memorize these two verses, Paul's prayer here from the end of 2 Thessalonians 1. Take time to do it. 
In the community guide that came out this week, there's some different ideas to help you memorize and pray through these verses. But the point isn't just to like put a little plastic jewel in a crown like in the Awana days and say, oh, I memorized it. The point is to say, to, to, to pray. <laughs> the point is to take Paul's prayer and pray that for ourselves, for our families, for one another, for our church family. And then as we interact together over this week, as families, in community groups, as we just see one another around town, I encourage you, in light of this verse, ask each other, man, what is the desire for good that you want to see God fulfill in your life? What is a, what is a work of faith that you want to see come to life that I can pray for? And then do it. Pray for one another. I get excited to think about what God might do in our midst as we pray these words over one another, actually believing that God hears us and that he has power to put himself on display through us, amen? I'm gonna invite the band to come back up. We're gonna sing one more song together. Um, And even now, would you just pray with me? Father, the reality of the judgment that your son is bringing is heavy and wonderful at the same time. We rejoice at the thought of the relief and glory that is coming to those who turn and trust in your son, not because of anything that we've done or deserved, but because you are a gracious, forgiving God. Lord, we tremble at the reality that our loved ones who don't know you yet now stand to face your vengeance. Would you open their eyes like you've opened ours? Would you use us through just the open statement of the truth that we believe? And would you open their eyes to see the beauty of Jesus now before it's too late? Father, would you make us worthy of your calling? Would you fulfill our every desire for good and work of faith by your power so that the name of your son Jesus might be glorified in us and we in him? And we pray all of this according to your grace and in the name of your mighty son Jesus, amen.